Welcome to SnoozeCast, the podcast designed to help you fall asleep. Find us on snoozecast.com and follow us on social media and wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is supported by Our Beating Hearts. Tonight, by listener request, we'll read the second part to the classic 1847 novel, Jane Eyre, by English writer Charlotte Bronte. It's the story of a young, orphaned girl who lives with her aunt and cousins and is mistreated by them. The novel is considered one of the greatest works of English fiction. In part one, we read chapter one and the opening of chapter two. Poor little Jane is bullied by her entire adopted family of an aunt and cousins, along with being misunderstood and treated meanly by their servants. After she is unfairly punished for standing up for herself by being locked in a guest room, she starts to examine this red-colored room further. room was a square chamber, very seldom slept in, I might say never, indeed, unless when a chance influx of visitors at Gateshead Hall rendered it necessary to turn to account all the accommodation it contained. Yet it was one of the largest and stateliest chambers in the mansion. A bed supported on massive pillars of mahogany, hung with curtains of deep red damask, stood out like a tabernacle in the center. The two large windows, with their blinds always drawn down, were half shrouded in festoons and falls of similar drapery. The carpet was red. The table at the foot of the bed was covered with a crimson cloth. The walls were a soft fawn color with a blush of pink in it. The wardrobe, the toilet table, the chairs were of darkly polished old mahogany. Out of these deep surrounding shades rose high and glared white the piled up mattresses and pillows of the bed spread with a snowy Marseille counterpane. Scarcely less prominent was an ample, cushioned, easy chair near the head of the bed, also white, with a footstool before it, and looking, as I thought, like a pale throne. This room was chill because it seldom had a fire. It was silent because remote from the nursery and kitchen. Solemn because it was known to be so seldom entered. The housemaid alone came here on Saturdays to wipe from the mirrors and the furniture a week's quiet dust. And Mrs. Reed herself, at far intervals, visited it to review the contents of a certain secret drawer in the wardrobe, where were stored diver's parchments, her jewel casket, and a miniature of her deceased husband. And in those last words lies the secret of the Red Room, the spell which kept it so lonely in spite of its grandeur. Mr. Reed had been dead nine years. It was in this chamber he breathed his last. Here he lay in state. Hence his coffin was borne by the undertaker's men. And, since that day, a sense of dreary consecration had guarded it from frequent intrusion. 
my seat, to which Bessie and the bitter Miss Abbott had left me riveted, was a low ottoman near the marble chimney piece. The bed rose before me. To my right hand, there was a high, dark wardrobe with subdued, broken reflections varying the gloss of its panels. To my left were the muffled windows. A great looking glass between them repeated the vacant majesty of the bed and room. I was not quite sure whether they had locked the door, and when I dared move, I got up and went to see. Alas, yes, no jail was ever more secure. Returning, I had to cross before the looking glass. My fascinated glance involuntarily explored the depth it revealed. All looked colder and darker in that visionary hollow than in reality. And the strange little figure there gazing at me, with a white face and arms specking the gloom, and glittering eyes of fear moving where all else was still, had the effect of a real spirit. I thought it like one of those tiny phantoms, half fairy, half imp. Bessie's evening stories represented as coming out of lone, ferny dells and moors, and appearing before the eyes of belated travelers. I returned to my stool. Superstition was with me at that moment, but it was not yet her hour for complete victory. My blood was still warm. The mood of the revolted slave was still bracing me with its bitter vigor. I had to stem a rapid rush of retrospective thought before I quailed to the dismal present. All John Reed's violent tyrannies all his sister's proud indifference, all his mother's aversion, all the servant's partiality, turned up in my disturbed mind like a dark deposit in a turbid well. Why was I always suffering, always browbeaten, always accused, forever condemned? Why could I never please? Why was it useless to try to win anyone's favor? Eliza, who was headstrong and selfish, was respected. Georgiana, who had a spoiled temper, a very acrid spite, a captious and insolent carriage, was universally indulged. Her beauty, her pink cheeks and golden curls, seemed to give delight to all who looked at her and to purchase indemnity for every fault. John, no one thwarted much less punished, though he twisted the necks of the pigeons, killed the little peachicks, set the dogs at the sheep, stripped the hothouse vines of their fruit, and broke the buds off the choicest plants in the conservatory. He called his mother old girl, too, sometimes reviled her for her dark skin, similar to his own, bluntly disregarded her wishes not unfrequently tore and spoiled her silk attire, and he was still her own darling. I dared commit no fault. I strove to fulfill every duty, and I was termed naughty and tiresome, sullen and sneaking, from morning to noon and from noon to night. My head still ached and bled from the blow and fall I had received, No one had reproved John for wantonly striking me, and because I had turned against him to avert further irrational violence, I was loaded with general opprobrium. Unjust, unjust, said my reason, forced by the agonizing stimulus into precocious though transitory power, and resolve equally wrought up instigated some strange expedient to achieve escape from insupportable oppression, as running away or, if that could not be effected, never eating or drinking more and letting myself die. 
What a consternation of soul was mine that dreary afternoon. How all my brain was in tumult, and all my heart in insurrection. Yet in what darkness, what dense ignorance, was the mental battle fought? I could not answer the ceaseless inward question. Why I thus suffered, now, at the distance of, I will not say how many years, I see it clearly. I was a discord in Gateshead Hall. I was like nobody there. I had nothing in harmony with Mrs. Reed or her children, or her chosen vassalage. If they did not love me, in fact, as little did I love them. They were not bound to regard with affection a thing that could not sympathize with one amongst them, a heterogeneous thing, opposed to them in temperament, in capacity, in propensities, a useless thing, incapable of serving their interest or adding to their pleasure, a noxious thing, cherishing the germs of indignation at their treatment, of contempt of their judgment. I know that had I been a sanguine, brilliant, careless, exacting, handsome, romping child, though equally dependent and friendless, Mrs. Reed would have endured my presence more complacently. Her children would have entertained for me more of the cordiality of fellow feeling. The servants would have been less prone to make me the scapegoat of the nursery. Daylight began to forsake the red room. It was past four o'clock and the beclouded afternoon was tending to drear twilight. I heard the rain still beating continuously on the staircase window, and the wind howling in the grove behind the hall. I grew by degrees cold as a stone, and then my courage sank. My habitual mood of humiliation, self-doubt, forlorn depression, fell damp on the embers of my decaying ire. All said I was wicked, and perhaps I might be so. What thought had I been but just conceiving of starving myself to death? That certainly was a crime, and was I fit to die? Or was the vault under the chancel of Gateshead Church an inviting born? In such vault, I had been told, did Mr. Reed lie buried? and led by this thought to recall his idea, I dwelt on it with gathering dread. I could not remember him, but I knew that he was my own uncle, my mother's brother, that he had taken me when a parentless infant to his house, and that in his last moments he had required a promise of Mrs. Reed that she would rear and maintain me as one of her own children. Mrs. Reed probably considered she had kept this promise, and so she had, I dare say, as well as her nature would permit her. But how could she really, like an interloper not of her race, and unconnected with her, after her husband's death, by any tie? It must have been most irksome to find herself bound by a hard-wrung pledge to stand in the stead of a parent to a strange child she could not love, and to see an uncongenial alien permanently intruded on her own family group. A singular notion dawned upon me. I doubted not, never doubted, that if Mr. Reed had been alive, he would have treated me kindly, and now... As I sat looking at the white bed and overshadowed walls, occasionally also turning a fascinated eye towards the dimly gleaming mirror, I began to recall what I had heard of dead men, troubled in their graves by the violation of their last wishes, revisiting the earth to punish the perjured and avenge the oppressed. And I thought Mr. Reed's spirit, harassed by the wrongs of his sister's child, 
might quit its abode, whether in the church vault or in the unknown world of the departed, and rise before me in this chamber. I wiped my tears and hushed my sobs, fearful lest any sign of violent grief might waken a preternatural voice to comfort me or elicit from the gloom some hallowed face bending over me with strange pity. This idea, consolatory in theory, I felt would be terrible if realized. With all my might, I endeavored to stifle it. I endeavored to be firm. Shaking my hair from my eyes, I lifted my head and tried to look boldly round the dark room. At this moment, a light gleaned on the wall. Was it? I asked myself. A ray from the moon penetrating some aperture in the blind? No. Moonlight was still, and this stirred. While I gazed, it glided up to the ceiling and quivered over my head. I can now conjecture readily that this streak of light was, in all likelihood, a gleam from a lantern carried by someone across the lawn. But then, prepared as my mind was for horror, shaken as my nerves were by agitation, I thought the swift darting beam was a herald of some coming vision from another world. My heart beat thick. My head grew hot. A sound filled my ears, which I deemed the rushing of wings. Something seems near me. I was oppressed suffocated. Endurance broke down. I rushed to the door and shook the lock in desperate effort. Steps came running along the outer passage. The key turned. Bessie and Abbott entered. Miss Eyre, are you ill? said Bessie. What a dreadful noise. It went quite through me, exclaimed Abbott. Take me out. Let me go into the nursery, was my cry. What for? Are you hurt? Have you seen something? Again demanded Bessie. Oh, I saw a light, and I thought a ghost would come. I had now got hold of Bessie's hand, and she did not snatch it from me. She had screamed out on purpose, declared Abbott in some disgust. And what a scream! If she had been in great pain, one would have excused it, but she only wanted to bring us all here. I know her naughty tricks. What is all this? demanded another voice peremptorily, and Mrs. Reed came along the corridor, her cap flying wide, her gown rustling stormily. Abbott and Bessie, I believe I gave orders that Jane Eyre should be left in the red room till I came to her myself. Miss Jane screamed so loud, ma'am, pleaded Bessie. Let her go, was the only answer. Loose Bessie's hand, child. You cannot succeed in getting out by these means. Be assured. I abhor artifice, particularly in children. It's my duty to show you that tricks will not answer. You will now stay here an hour longer and it's only on condition of perfect submission and stillness that I shall liberate you then. Oh, aunt, have pity. Forgive me. I can't endure it. Let me be punished some other way. I shall be killed if silence, this violence, is almost repulsive. And so no doubt she felt it. I was a precocious actress in her eyes. She sincerely looked on me as a compound of virulent passions, mean spirit, and dangerous duplicity. Bessie and Abbott, having retreated, Mrs. Reed, impatient of my now frantic anguish and wild sobs, abruptly thrust me back and locked me in, without farther parley. I heard her sweeping away, and soon after she was gone. I suppose I had a species of fit. Unconsciousness closed the scene. Chapter 3 
The next thing I remember is waking up with a feeling as if I had had a frightful nightmare and seeing before me a terrible red glare crossed with thick black bars. I heard voices, too, speaking with a hollow sound and as if muffled by a rush of wind or water, agitation, uncertainty, and an all-predominating sense of terror confused my faculties. Ere long, I became aware that someone was handling me, lifting me up and supporting me in a sitting posture, and that more tenderly than I had ever been raised or upheld before. I rested my head against a pillow or an arm and felt easy. In five minutes more, the cloud of bewilderment dissolved. I knew quite well that I was in my own bed and that the red glare was the nursery fire. It was night. A candle burnt on the table. Bessie stood at the bed foot with a basin in her hand and a gentleman sat in a chair near my pillow, leaning over me. I felt an inexpressible relief, a soothing conviction of protection and security, when I knew that there was a stranger in the room, an individual not belonging to Gateshead and not related to Mrs. Reed. Turning from Bessie, though her presence was far less obnoxious to me than that of Abbott, for instance, would have been. I scrutinized the face of the gentleman. I knew him. It was Mr. Lloyd, an apothecary, sometimes called in by Mrs. Reed when the servants were ailing. For herself and the children, she employed a physician. Well, who am I? he asked. I pronounced his name offering him at the same time my hand. He took it, smiling and saying, We shall do very well by and by. Then he laid me down, and addressing Bessie, charged her to be very careful that I was not disturbed during the night, having given some further directions, and intimates that he should call again the next day. He departed, to my grief. I felt so sheltered and befriended while he sat in the chair near my pillow. And as he closed the door after him, all the room darkened and my heart again sank. Inexpressible sadness weighed it down. Do you feel as if you should sleep, miss? asked Bessie, rather softly. Scarcely dared I answer her, for I feared the next sentence might be rough. I will try. Would you like to drink, or could you eat anything? No, thank you, Bessie. Then I think I shall go to bed for it's past twelve o'clock, but you may call me if you want anything in the night. Wonderful civility, this. It emboldened me to ask a question. Bessie, what is the matter with me? Am I ill? You fell sick, I suppose, in the red room with crying. You'll be better soon, no doubt. Bessie went into the housemaid's apartment, which was near. I heard her say, Sarah, come and sleep with me in the nursery. I daren't for my life be alone with that poor child tonight. She might die. It's such a strange thing she should have that fit. I wonder if she saw anything. Mrs. was rather too hard. Sarah came back with her. They both went to bed. They were whispering together for half an hour before they fell asleep. I caught scraps of their conversation. 
from which I was able only too distinctly to infer the main subject discussed. Something passed her, all dressed in white and vanished, a great black dog behind him, three loud raps on the chamber door, a light in the churchyard just over his grave, etc., etc. At last, both slept. The fire and the candle went out. For me, the watches of that long night passed in ghastly wakefulness, strained by dread, such dread as only children can feel. No severe or prolonged bodily illness followed this incident of the Red Room. It only gave my nerves a shock, of which I feel the reverberation to this day. Yes, Mrs. Reed, to you I owe some fearful pangs of mental suffering, but I ought to forgive you, for you knew not what you did. While rending my heartstrings, you thought you were only uprooting my bad propensities. Next day, by noon, I was up and dressed and sat wrapped in a shawl by the nursery hearth. I felt physically weak and broken down, but my worst ailment was an unutterable wretchedness of mind, a wretchedness which kept drawing from me silent tears. No sooner had I wiped one salt drop from my cheek than another followed. Yet, I thought, I ought to have been happy, for none of the reeds were there. They were all gone out in the carriage with their mama. Abbott, too, was sewing in another room. And Bessie, as she moved hither and thither, putting away toys and arranging drawers, addressed to me every now and then a word of unwanted kindness. This state of things should have been to me a paradise of peace, accustomed as I was to a life of ceaseless reprimand and thankless complaints. But, in fact, my racked nerves were now in such a state that no calm could soothe and no pleasure excite them agreeably. Bessie had been down into the kitchen, and she brought up with her a tart on a certain brightly painted china plate, whose bird of paradise, nestling in a wreath of rosebuds, had been wont to stir in me a most enthusiastic sense of admiration and which plate I had often petitioned to be allowed to take in my hand in order to examine it more closely, but had always hitherto been deemed unworthy of such a privilege. This precious vessel was now placed on my knee, and I was cordially invited to eat the circlet of delicate pastry upon it. Vain favor. Coming, like most other favors, long deferred and often wished for, too late. I couldn't eat the tart, and the plumage of the bird, the tints of the flowers, seemed strangely faded. I put both tart and plate away. Bessie asked if I would have a book. The word book 
acted as a transient stimulus, and I begged her to fetch Gulliver's Travels from the library. This book I had again and again perused with delight.